The Institute of Nautical Archaeology's 2001 underwater survey along the Turkish coast ended with the discovery of a 6th century BC shipwreck at Pabuch Bernou near Bodrum. This was exciting, for no wreck of that date had ever been excavated in the eastern Mediterranean. We began the 2002 Smothers Bruni expedition to Pabuch Bernou with an early June meeting in the Mary and Lamar II's reading room of INA's Bodrum Library. Once more, we had an international team made up of both new faces and INA veterans. Because the site was so close to Bodrum, we decided to commute daily. What's the status of the catamaran now? Today they're going to put the port side alternator back together. We weighed anchor each morning after the 15 to 20 minute drive to the Ichmiler shipyard on the outskirts of Bodrum. Beha Subai was again captain of Virazan. <laughs> and Murat Tilev was once more skipper of our catamaran Milawanda, the support vessel for our submersible Carolyn. We could have driven farther out of Bodrum and boarded our vessels closer to the excavation site, but the 45-minute sail each morning and evening gave additional time on board to keep up with the daily log and other records, to prepare the recompression chamber for any emergency, and to tend to other important matters. Elizabeth Green, Assistant Project Director in charge of archaeology, composed the dive rosters for her twice-daily staff briefings on Virazon. A buoy marked the heavy anchors that allowed us to moor directly above the shipwreck, just off our night watchman's guardhouse. As soon as we were moored, the team sprang into its practice routine, putting the dive ladder over the side, luring oxygen hoses for the divers to decompress on at the end of every dive, turning the oxygen on, and filling air tanks. The first dive will have veterans of many INA expeditions. Engineer Murat Tilev, archaeologist Sheila Matthews, conservator Asaf Uran, and Mark Polzer, a graduate student in the Nautical Archaeology program at Texas A&M University. The team will spend 20 minutes at a depth of 130 to 140 feet their dive carefully controlled by a timekeeper on Virazon, who will send over 2,000 dives down and signal them when to come up. Our first task was to install a safety refuge, our underwater telephone booth. Lifting balloons eased the task of moving the heavy iron plates that hold the booth down when it is filled with air. We situated the booth next to the wreck site so that in case of any equipment failure, fresh air was close at hand rather than being more than 100 feet straight up. We then gridded the site with string and put specially designed targets on amphora mouths to aid the digital mapping by photography. Almost immediately, Yashar Yildiz, representative of the Turkish Ministry of Culture, found and labeled an inakawi, or wine pitcher. After it was photographed in situ, Yashar fanned the sand away, removed it, and carried it in a plastic bucket to the surface. By chance, it was archaeologist Mehmet Yildiz, Yashar's son, who was waiting on Virazan to take the find. The excavation campaign, which lasted nearly five months, was tiring. We did not have enough bunks on Virazon to allow everyone to have a comfortable afternoon siesta, as in past excavation camps. But as usual, we ate well. Water soaks the heat out of your body far faster than air, so divers need plenty of calories. And we got them. After lunch, Elizabeth Green gave instructions for afternoon dives by conducting the day's second briefing. This airlift is the one that is shallowest, so it has a tendency to take all of the air. To remedy that problem, we put a valve on the hose to this airlift. Whoever is working on this upper left airlift cannot open. Back on the seabed, 
Excavators used airlifts, nearly vertical suction pipes, to remove the blanket of sand that hid most of the ancient ship's secrets. Other excavators brought baskets down to retrieve newly exposed cargo. As on most ancient Mediterranean wrecks, the most numerous artifacts were cargo amphoras, probably made somewhere along the same coast off which we dive, but farther north, perhaps around Miletus or the island of Samos, although at least one amphora seemed more likely to have originated at Canidos within sight of Pabuchpernu. We sealed their mouths before raising them to save any valuable organic remains that might be inside. Once on Virazon, amphora contents were carefully examined. In one instance, conservator Asaf Uran assisted in the birth of an Olpe, another kind of wine pitcher that had found its way into the amphora. Like a baby, one more push, one more push. Remains in the sediment can tell us much about ancient trade and economics. Archaeology students Orkan Koyasiolu and Mehmet Yildiz revealed this amphora's contents by the discovery of a grape seed. A lot of the work of sieving, downloading digital photographs into computers, developing plans, keeping the daily journal, and cataloging artifacts took place on the 45-minute homeward sail to each Malir every evening. The days were long. Often, Virzon did not reach port until 7 p.m., giving only time to drive home or to the INA dormitory, shower, have dinner, and get some sleep before an early morning rise next day. On the one non-diving day each week, our archaeology students, guided by Faith Henschel, stayed busy in INA's Nixon Griffiths Conservation Laboratory. Deniz Soyarslan and Mehmet Yildiz arranged amphoras for Deniz to draw, while Selda Ozhan cataloged. And Mark Polzer instructed Mehmet to sketch accurately. Vulcan Kaya took most of the artifact photographs. Milawanda did not come out from Ichmalir with their submersible Carolyn every day. When it did, one of our pilots, Fayaz or Murat, went over the extensive free dive checklist. In this case, Fayaz was pilot. He could take me or any one of the team archaeologists to the wreck so that we could observe the excavation in progress for hours at a time instead of only 20 minutes. And we stayed dry, clear headed, and comfortable for that time. Milawanda was designed and mostly built in Bodrum and is a perfect launching platform. Once we were underwater, INA Director Claude Dutuy kept in touch by means of our wireless communication system. From Carolyn, we might for the next few hours watch excavators clean around an Inakawi, or remove an Olpe and carry it gently to a waiting lifting basket for safe transportation up to Virazon. Or we might see the discovery of a large plate and observe its excavator, remove it from the sand and carry it off the wreck, past the telephone booth to a waiting container. Or see another excavator cleaning around a bowl. When they hear the timekeeper signal to come up, each team puts its fins back on. They have worked without fins to avoid stirring up sediment. Then they swim up to the decompression stop, where they change to breathing pure oxygen while they decompress. At last, Carolyn ascends and returns to Milawanda to be winched up to deck level.
It was an especially exciting day when we raised the ship's stone anchor stock. For inside Carolyn was a special visitor, Dr. Malcolm Weiner, founder of the Institute for Aegean Prehistory, which funded INA's purchase of the submersible. Five of INA's most experienced divers were on the wreck. Robin Piercy and Tufan Tarana attached a lifting balloon to the stock and filled it with air to buoy the heavy stone as they began its trip to the surface. Murat Tilev held the floodlights for Don Fry to record the operation on video, and Sheila Matthews covered it all with still digital photographs. When the stock broke the surface, Archaeology student Orkan Koyaseolu detached the balloon from the stone so that the stock could be winched onto Virazan's deck, where it was examined by Fea Subai, already up and out of Carolyn. Later in the day, after our little fleet sailed back to port, Tufan Taranla and others had the hardest job. Without a lifting balloon, they had to carry the stock ashore and load it into the bed of a pickup truck to be taken to our laboratory. By far, the most important discovery of the 2002 campaign was part of the ship's hull, for just as INA has, for the first time, traced the slow evolution from ancient to modern ship construction, now it would have the opportunity to show for the first time how archaic Greek shipwrights built their vessels. The first of two planks, each over two meters long, appeared downslope at the deepest part of the site. This is where Fred Van Dornick, after studying our site plans, accurately predicted we should find part of the ship's bow. Even before the plank was raised, we realized its importance. The plank was not held to its neighboring plank by mortise and tenon joints, as on the Ullabaroon shipwreck of around 1300 BC and on the Kyrenia shipwreck of around 300 BC. Instead, the planks were laced together, the bindings running through triangular holes and pegged tight. Ceramics also need desalinization. The field work of 2002 ended with our loading intact artifacts onto a pickup truck, checking their inventory numbers, and then unloading them at the Bodrum Museum of Underwater Archaeology. A human chain took them up the castle steps to the large freshwater tanks near the conservation laboratory. Mm -hmm. 